Hello and welcome to episode 75 of No Rares Required. Uh, this is a weekly podcast, although <laughs> sometimes there's a little bit of a uh, break in between sets. Um, but anyway, it's focused on limited or draft and dives deep into each color pair or archetype. And the early frontrunner for Outlaws at Thunder Junction and soon to be overdrafted is Celestia Mounts. Uh, as usual, we'll start things off with my draft skeleton. For each archetype, I make a draft strategy that uses 17 commons, 5 uncommons, and 1 rare or mythic. Thus, the name of the series, No Rare is Required, because if you can build a winning strategy with just commons and uncommons, it will dramatically increase the consistency of your draft strategy, since you can't rely on opening a bomb in every draft. So the big takeaway is that green is definitely the strongest color, and mount synergies uh, work quite well, but aren't super necessary you don't need to go all in on the mount synergies um white has amazing removal but it is enchantment removal and then you can also protect your big green beef like your cactarantula <laughs> with a snakeskin veil and take up the shield so with the larger picture in mind let's dive into the 17 lands data so if this is your first time going through this process hold on for a second <laughs> First, I like to calculate the total wins created, and I do this by taking the average of the game's played win rate and the game in hand win rate on 17 lands, which is a website that tracks uh, Magic the Gathering data, uh, specifically on draft. And then I subtract the average win rate of all of the users in the archetype that I'm looking at and multiply it by the numbers of games played. And what this allows me to do is kind of filter through, regardless of um, how good the player is, um, I can look at what is working for the majority of people within the archetype. So um, just really quickly to read down the list, I'm going to try not to read through too many of the lists because it does, there's, you know, it's just so much. Um, but Throw from the Saddle, Miriam, Herd Whisperer, Buried in the Garden, Congregation Griff, Lassoed by the Law, Take Up the Shield, Seraphic Steed, Trained Arnix, Shepherd of the Clouds, Outcaster Greenblade, Frontier Seeker, Creosote Heath, Stubborn Burrow Fiend, Mystical Tether, Honorary Tumblewag, and Wily Duke Atten Hero. And um, <clears throat> if you don't know what these are, we're going to cover a, a good chunk of them uh, in a little bit. The other thing that I can do is look at the reverse of this process and look at what is just what is causing the uh, most wins to be lost, right? The most wins destroyed. And um, so this is the, the cards that are being the most problematic for the most amount of people. This does not mean that they are an unplayable card. It just means that the, the, the average person would benefit from avoiding them. And uh, the top three here are Ariat's Lullaby. And um, it's a sorcery for one and a white. Destroy tapped uh, target tapped creature. You gain two life. The problem with this kind of card is that it's better in a flying strategy or an evasive strategy where you're attacking and trading blows with your opponent. If you're just playing this aggressive beatdown strategy that Celestia Mounts is, then they have to play on defense and then they're no longer tapping their creatures and they're just waiting for you to attack and then block, right? So then this card becomes a dead card in your hand. Surprisingly, Voracious Varmint was second on the list, and I had my eyes as this this one being a good green common, and um, because you can sacrifice it to destroy target artifact or an enchantment, and there are seven different uh, Oblivion Rings or white, you know, in, uh, enchantment removal in the set. Um, but one thing that I do think it points to is that you, unlike Phyrexia All Will Be One. Um, this archetype or this set uh, benefits of getting to your top end. So I've noticed that having a lower amount of two drops in your deck is actually beneficial. And I think that's really what this is saying is that although the destroy enchantment effect is useful, at least in some matchups, the 2 2 vigilance for two quickly gets outclassed. And so uh, just jamming your deck full of, you know, voracious varmints isn't going to work as well as it may have, at least to me, thought that it was going to do better at the beginning. So, and, and and of course, this is all, you know, likely to change throughout the weeks. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, the other third trap on the list here from the data was Outlaw Medic. And this one makes a little bit more sense. You get a 1-3 lifeling for one and a white. And when it dies, draw a card. And this archetype specifically wants to be aggressive. Are there going to be archetypes where Outlaw Medic is great? And that's exactly what you want. Yes, but in this one, you don't want a 1-3 that's not a mount. Um, it, you just want to be more aggressive in this archetype. 
So with that taken care of, the next thing that I like to do is uh, I take those wins created and then I divide them by the number of times that the card was picked. Not necessarily played, but just picked during a draft. And then I graph it against the average taken at, or ATA, and fit the data with a logarithmic regression. And then by calculating the distance of the card to the fitted line, which again, thank you, Carl, aka 2.cubed, we'll call value over replacement, or uh, VORP. And what uh, so this allows me to see what the top cards are in uh, different time points within a draft. So you can see this list <laughs> is long. There are a lot of rares and mythics that are uh, worth opening in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Um, so long, I couldn't even actually fit them all onto one list. So again, for to kind of keep things a little bit shorter than what I've been doing in the past, because um, what I've been doing in the past hasn't been super successful, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cover the top three of the uh, of, of of each list. So for the rares uh, that you're going to pick up early, the top of the list, the best card that you can open for the Celestia Mount deck is a Celestia Mount. You get Seraphic Steed, which is a 2-2 unicorn mount for green and a white with first strike and lifelink. And then whenever Seraphic Steed attacks while saddled, create a 3-3 white angel creature token with flying. The saddle is four. But there are um, the Drover Grizzly is a 4-2 for two and a green at common. So you can saddle this as early as turn three when you're attacking with it and create a 3-3 three, three, uh, White Angel creature token with flying. So it's an absolutely busted card as long as you are able to saddle it early. Um, and even then, a First Strike Lifelinker has got nothing to complain about. The next uh, second uh, rare on the list is Bristly Bill Spine Sower, which is a one in a green for a 2-2 two -two with landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. And then it has a late game mana sink of three double pip green to double the number of plus one plus one counters on each creature that you control. So this isn't specifically good in the Celestia deck. Um, it's just good in every green archetype. And um, is, you know, kind of reminds me of the... Um, Luminarch veteran that you know, just you don't get it as as consistently because you eventually do run out of lands to cast. But then later in the game, once you've run out of lands to cast, you can start doubling the number of plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. And it's kind of fun because, you know, you, you kind of want to put the plus one plus one counters across your board so that later you get a bigger pump out of your mana sink. So. Um, but absolutely busted card. Definitely look for it. It, it be a reason to be green, although there are plenty in this set. And then um, Honorary Tumblewag is uh, a two and a green for a two two uh, brush wag mount. So this one does have more synergies in the green white Celestia mount space. However, it is still a really good green card just in general. At the beginning of combat on your turn, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. So another one of those Lun Lunarch veteran effects. Um, and then whenever it attacks while saddled, double the number of plus one plus one counters on target creature. So you don't even need to be um, putting the counters on it. You can target a different creature with the plus one plus one counters. However, you do have to attack with this um, to get and, and saddle with it to get the double uh, counters on your target creature. So it's best, I think, to usually put it on the tumble wag itself so that when you saddle with it, it becomes big enough to not just die on the attack. Um, but yeah, very impressive rare. <laughs> Loving it a lot. So next up is the um, uncommons and... Some of the good commons and 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 kind of undervalued rares, but mostly the commons for pick 2.5 through 5. And again, the list is long, so I won't be going through each individual card. But the top three is Miriam Herd Whisperer. This is the signpost uncommon. It has mount synergies. You get a 3-2 for a green and a white. As long as it's your turn, mounts and vehicles you control have hexproof. And then whenever a mount or vehicle you control attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on it. And this is huge because of your crazy busted mounts like Congregation Griff, which if you have Miriam in play, it's not you. Every time that you attack with a mount, you're getting an, a permanent plus one plus one counter. So this becomes a two five and then a three six and you've got a flying and lifelink. And then it also um, so sorry, it's a one four flying lifelink for one, a green and a white. Whenever it attacks while saddled, it gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of mounts you control and it has saddle three. Um, for those who are listening audio only. And so um, 
This thing can get absolutely huge if you have a lot of mount synergies. You don't need it to be that much though, because even if this is just hitting for two or three damage a turn with lifelink, it's very difficult to race. And then it is a large body, uh, which has been beneficial for clogging up the air. Wily Duke at Atian Hero is one of the undervalued rares. Um, uh, I think as people figure out how good Celestia is, uh, you, this will be <laughs> more uh, valued more highly. But for the time being, um, it's really only good if you have saddle synergies. So the mount, spe the mount synergies specifically, um, because it is a 4-2 vigilance for one, a green and a white. And then when it becomes tapped, you gain one life and draw a card. So when you're attacking with it, it's not going to tap because of the vigilance. But you can saddle for four with it, and then you gain a life and draw a card every time that you're saddling something. So it's it's perfect for enabling your mount synergy. And now for value of a replacement for picks five through eight, and this is where you're going to see some of the undervalued common or uncommons and then most of your commons. And again, the list is very long for this set. Um, I imagine over time that this is going to get a little bit smaller because um, right now, yeah, it, it's just Celestia has been overperforming. So there's lots to cho choose from from this as it gets overdrafted. You're going to see pick, picks five through eight and eight onward kind of decrease. And we're already starting to see this a little bit. So if you haven't drafted the Celestia deck, get on it, because I think it's going to be like Boros in Murders at Karlov Manor. Um, where it's just it's going to become overdrafted very soon. Um, but yeah, top of the list here, we've got Throw from the Saddle, which is um, one of the top commons for green white. It's a good removal spell in green, but if you have mount synergies, it's busted because if you put um, so for one in a green target creature you control gets plus one plus one until end of turn, put a plus one plus one counter on it instead if it's a mount. So that that's why like if you've got like seven or eight mounts in your deck or even more like 11, um, then this becomes a fantastic removal spell that leaves a permanent counter behind. Um, and it is not a fight spell. It is a bite spell. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. So just really good removal in this set. And this set has a lot of bombs. As you notice, a lot of rares and a lot of uncommons that you're going to want to remove, like the steed. So um, definitely value removal quite highly. And then also because of valuing removal quite highly, value responses to that removal quite highly, like Snakeskin Veil and Take Up the Shield. So Take Up the Shield for is an instant for one and a white, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, it gains lifelink and indestructible until end of turn. So you, this is one of those ways that if, if you are trading blows with your opponent, you can just suddenly um, win the race with the lifelink. And then also the indestructible is really nice. Um, if they go to destroy target creature, you can use it in response to save your creature. And then again, it leaves behind that permanent counter, which does have a little bit of synergies within the green space. Uh, if you do have like the tumble wag being able to double its counters, um, same thing with bristly bill. So uh, and then the other thing to talk about is that it is a multicolored set. So there is definitely a payoff to playing more than one color. And so I would I would take the first copy of whatever color pair you are quite highly because a 9-8 split is is never ideal. Really, you want a 10-10 split of green and white in in limited if you can hack it, right? Um, but being able to do so makes it so that you can have a little bit more of a flexible mana base if you do pick up um, some things to splash. So again, if you go back and you look at the list, there are some things, especially in the Abzan space, so black, green, white, uh, there are definitely some cards to look for to splash and as, as well as in blue with like Bonnie Paul and in red um, with Annie um, and uh, the, the 4 4 Ward 2 signpost common for Gruel also made the list. Um, the Cactus Folk sure shot, I think. So um, definitely look to splash in the set and therefore value your desert lands that allow you to have a more flexible mana base a little bit higher than maybe you are typically comfortable with. I don't know how <laughs> some people really like to splash. I'm, I usually don't. Right. So it's a little bit of a um, out of my comfort zone to play with multiple colors. Um, and then last, we look at the value of a replacement for picks eight and onward. And these are the cards that you can expect to kill, at least at the time of this um, of this episode, which is relatively early on into the format. We haven't even really gotten into the first week of drafting. Um, 
But usually you want to see this um, value of a replacement for eight and onward to be like three to five cards. And so the fact that it's already down to two again points, at least to me, that the archetype is already on its way of becoming overdrafted. And um, but Bucolic Ranch is uh, a land that um, you get a, a colorless desert that can tap to add one mana of any color as long as you're spending this mana on a mount spell. And then for three colorless and tap, you can kind of do a scry effect. You look at the top card of your library. If it's a mount, you may reveal it and put it in your hand. And if you don't put it in your hand, you may put it on the bottom of your library. So some people like this card, even if they aren't in the mount specific deck, because you can use it as a scry land. So if you remember in Strixhaven, there was a deck or there was a, a land that allowed you to do a scry one for four colorless and tap it. Um, so we, time will tell if whether or not this is something that should only belong in the mount deck or if it belongs in other decks as well. Um, for right now, though, um, it is clearly something that I look to pick up in the mount deck. It gives you additional dig if you get to the top deck and then it gives you more flexibility in your in your mana as long as you are casting mount spells. A little bit harder on your on your mana base if you're not so that's what makes me hesitant to whether or not it'll be included in other archetypes and then the last one that i look to wheel is the sterling supplier so you've got a four and a uh, white for a three four flyer when it enters the battlefield put a plus one plus one counter on another target creature you control so as long as you have another creature on your board and this is a very creature centric strategy um, this is giving you a 4-5 worth of stats, and a 3-4 flyer does quite well against the other flyers in the format. So I've been pretty impressed with the Sterling Supplier. Um, tomorrow I will be covering the second top performing archetype, and afterwards I will leave it up to you about what I cover next week, so look for the poll on YouTube. And the Arena Open, <clears throat> excuse me, the Arena Open as well as my Cash Draft Tournament, ACDC, are both happening on May 4th. You do still have some time to prepare. And if you would like to join my um, tournament, then look for the details in Discord. And as always, remember to click like and subscribe. It's the best way to help support me for free. You can also join the Discord if you want uh, the VORP guide I do uh, for each archetype as well. I do update it week weekly. And um, again, thank you so much to those who can support me financially, um, my YouTube members, as well as my Twitch subscribers and Patreons. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> and thanks for listening and being a part of my community. Good luck with your games and future trophies. Thank you all for the support, and I'll see you tomorrow.